Okay. <clears throat> so um, let's get into a lot of meat here. Um, I'm, I'm going to do my best to <clears throat> break this down and to make things plain and simple. And um, try to bring some understanding here as God, by his Holy Spirit, leads me to share this word. Um, I want you to be open to what I'm getting ready to share here. Um, it, it, some of it might shatter some thoughts within your mind of things that you might have been taught that wasn't true. But I want you to see this in the word and um, go from there. All right. I want to deal with the clarity. I want to clarify some things about the one true God. There is only one. And um, I want to show you that. So let's just start here and then see how the Lord guides me and does this. Okay, John 3, 16, let's just start there. This is a very familiar passage of scripture we love to quote. It's one of my favorite, um, if not my favorite, because this involves <laughs> how I got saved. This is what made that possible. So, um, this is one of my favorite, but let's go to John 3.16 if you can. If you can't, just listen. You can go there later if you want. I promise you it's in there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay. Um, one thing I want, want to deal with is God gave his only begotten son as an act of, of his love. Okay, so um, if, we, if we were to say that the way he gave him was in a spiritual sense, then that would not mean... Um, that would not be any act of love if he's just a spirit. But if he gave him in the form of a man, in the form of flesh, then we can see how he's the only begotten son. And we can see how this would be an act of love because in order for him to be called the only, then there's got to be something about him, something about his sonship that is making him distinctly the only. Because he's not the only one that was called son of God. And I'm going to prove that to you in scripture. Hold on to that thought. All right. We see that that Jesus was the only begotten son of God. But let's look at something else here. Let's go. To, let's look at Genesis. Let's look at Genesis six. I'll show you he wasn't the only son. He wasn't the only one that was called son of God. He's the only one that was called only begotten son, but not the only one that was called son. All right, look at Genesis 6 and 1. Um, now it came to pass 
when men begin to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters, see it? Sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, <clears throat> and all of all and, and of all whom they chose. Okay. So we see that the angels that came down, they were called sons of God. Now this was before the only begotten son of God. This was way before that. Way before Jesus came in the flesh and was born of a virgin. Way before that. They were called sons of God. Not, not even just one, but sons. Plural. More than one. Sons of God. So we see that term right here. Now let's look at something else. Look at Luke 3, 38. I'll show you where Adam was called a son of God. Watch this. Watch this. Adam was called a son of God, according to Luke 3 and 38. This is going over genealogy. I won't read all the genealogy. I'll just read the part where it gets right to Adam. All right. So Luke 3, 38, the son of Enosh, the son of Zeth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Adam was called a son of God. Adam was called the son of God. So, <clears throat> so, so what do we see here that causes Jesus, who was born of a virgin later, to be called the only? Because if we say son of God, he's not the only because we see the angels in Genesis 6 were sons of God, plural. And then we see Adam before them, we see that, the, that, that Adam was called the son of God. So what is making Jesus the, the only, what's making him only? So there's got to be an, a distinction here um, <clears throat> of his sonship or what his sonship consists of. Because if his sonship consists of the same thing that Adam's sonship consists of, then he would not be the only. It would be him and Adam. And if his sonship consists of the same thing that the angels, the fallen angels' sonship consisted of, then he would not be the only. But what makes him the only after he's come into the world, after his existence? He comes later. They were before him and they were called sons. He comes after and he's called the only. <laughs> so what is making him distinctly the only? Watch this. There is something about him that, 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 that involves his sonship that was different than theirs. And I'm going to show you what was called son. There was something about him that was called son of God. <clears throat> I 
that was not mm, the same as the angels. Um, actually, I'll just show you. I'll show you what it was. If you go to Luke 1, yeah, go to Luke 1. Let's see what was called Son of God. What was called only begotten Son of God. Because if we can identify the difference of his sonship as opposed to Adam, and opposed to the the angels, then we can we can identify what it means when it says only begotten son. <laughs> Let's see it. Now, if he existed in heaven as a son, or a pre-existent son, as Trinitarians would tell you that he existed spiritually as a pre-existing son and that it was the son of God that got into a body called son of, of God. Um, when Bible doesn't teach that, it teaches God was in the flesh. All right. Now, if he, if, if he pre-existed as a spiritual son of God, then his sonship would be no different than the angels. <laughs> because they were spirits and they were sons. And if he spiritually existed as a son, then he would be a spirit and a son and therefore could not be called only. There's something about him that's making him only. All right, Luke 1. And let's look at, where do I want to go? Let's look at, just look at verse 35. Okay. And this is the angel Gabriel talking to Mary. I'm trying to skip through some of it so you know I don't re over, give you information overload <clears throat> Luke 135 and the angel answered that would be Gabriel that's speaking and the angel answered and said to her the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest now the highest is you know that's the most high God and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that holy thing, that holy thing, that holy thing, that holy thing, who is to be born to you will be called Son of God. Okay, so we see that the power, the, the Holy Spirit is going to um, come upon Mary. This is how she gives birth to the Son. This is how he's made. The power, um, the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary and the power of the highest, which is God, overshadows her. And causes the conception. All right. Now, that conception in the womb, that flesh, that body, is called by the angel Gabriel a holy thing. It's just a thing at that time. A holy thing. Now, the thing, the holy thing, the body, that when she's conceived in the womb, is going to be given a title. He says that you shall call that holy thing son of God. So, son of God here 
is referring to the body. He was not a pre-existing son. He was made, as you see, what is being called the son of God. Very clearly, you shall call that holy thing son of God. That holy thing should be called son of God. What was the holy thing? The holy thing was the body. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> the reason why his sonship is different. And he's the only begotten son. Even though he's a son after Adam was already called a son. And he's a son after the, the, the angels was already called sons of God and still distinctly the only is because he's son in a different way than them. And his sonship is physical sonship of a woman that is born under the law. For it is written that he came from David. He was born of a woman who was born under the law, that he may redeem those who was under the law. So he inherited something from a woman. Adam did not. Adam was created from scratch. Adam did not come through a woman. Neither did the holy angels. Neither did they come through a woman, or the fallen angels, I should say, because they fell at that time. They didn't come through a woman. But this one here came through a woman and was birthed through a woman. So he began as the only begotten son. Now, if he began, oh man, this is deep. If he began as the only begotten son, then he did not pre-exist as a spiritual son. That is the reason why you will not find, and I repeat, you will not find anywhere in Scripture before the body the term only begotten son. You ain't going to find it. You will not find the spirit that was before the body being referred to as the only begotten son because the only begotten son was not the spirit <laughs> God did not beget a spirit the only begotten son was only begotten because he partook of the genes of a woman so he came through a woman, and that's why he's the only begotten. That's why he's only begotten. Now, the word begotten, even if you translate it in the Greek, it means it means to begin. So he started somewhere. If he's begotten, he started somewhere. So the son did not always exist. Did not. Did not. Now you're thinking, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wasn't he the word? Let's look at that. I'll show you who the word was. <laughs> I'll show you the word was God, and then I'm going to show you who God was. <laughs> All right. Listen to this. Listen to this, y'all. I told you this might shatter some of your belief. <clears throat> Look at John 1 and 1. We're going to see who the word was. Okay? And we're going to see did the son of God claim to be the word. We're going to see that. We're, we're going to see that. We're going to see. We're going to see who the son of God claims to be. Let's see if he claims to be the word. All right? Because I know that's what you're thinking. You're thinking that... The Son of God was the Word. So he had to always be here. 
But I'm going to show you that the Son of God was just a body. <laughs> and that's why he's only begotten. When there were others that were called sons of God before him. All right, all right. Let's see it. John 1 and 1. Let's just go there. This is the famous scripture here. In the beginning was the word. Now, notice. It says in the beginning was the word. Does it say in the beginning was this the only begotten son? Does it say in the beginning was the son? No. It says in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Does it say only begotten son of God? Does it say that the word was the son? No. It says the word was God. Let's read it the way it says it. The word was God. Okay. He was in the beginning. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. We're going to see who that him is in a minute. Because <laughs> I think you got a little confusion there. I'm going to help you out. <laughs> in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And, and the light shines in darkness, and darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. I want you to keep that in mind, too. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, we know that the Son of God said that he was sent from God. But right here, we see that John says, it says that John was sent from God. You see? But, but the way that John was sent from God was not from heaven. John was not sent from heaven. But he is still sent from God. So what we have is we have sent from heaven or sent from God in heaven. And then we have sent from God. Sent from God is consistent with what happens in the earth. Sent from above is, is a different story. That means you came from heaven. You came from up there. You came from God up there. Now, let's, let's, let's continue. Let's continue. This man came for a witness, to be a witness of that light, of the light, that all through him might believe. Okay? He was not that light. John was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light, that he was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. To every man coming into the world. To every man coming into the world. So you come into the world from the flesh. Coming into the world. See here, let me, let me show y'all something. Coming, every, everyone who's in the world came into the world. But that doesn't mean that you existed as a spirit before. That doesn't mean that you was in spiritual existence first. When we hear the term came into the world, what we automatically have assumed is that that means that he was spiritually here first as a spirit. Then he came into the world. No, it just said that every man. Let me read it again. Let me read it again. Watch, <clears throat> verse 9, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So all of us that are here, we can identify with came into the world. But that does not mean that we spiritually existed. <laughs> I 
I just want you to see that. I just want you to see that. That all of us are, are, are have come into the world. Okay? Now, <clears throat> look at verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. So now this is talking about something that pre-existed. This is talking about something that pre-existed because the world was made through him. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. You see? Okay. So, let's deal with two things. The first thing. Let's deal with being sent, and then let's deal with coming into the world. All right. So, there's a passage of scripture that says this. Jesus says that he came from the Father. Proceeded from the Father, in case you have any questions of what he means by that. <clears throat> so, in the beginning was the Word, not Son. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not Son of God, not only begotten Son. No, the Word was God. Okay? Now, the word is simply what God speaks. That's why he was able to say that he came from God, proceeded from God. Meaning, he, it was not another one sitting up there as another spirit next to him. That's not what we had. The Word is God, the Father. And the Father spoke His Word into a body. So that is what was sent from above. The Father sent part of Himself. <laughs> because the Word, Jesus told you where it came from. We know he's not referring to his flesh. His flesh didn't come from heaven. So he's talking about the spirit. But what was the spirit? The spirit was the word. What was the word? The word was God. Who is God? Jesus said the father is the only true God. And does not include himself as the son, as, as God himself. He says his father is. As a matter of fact, he says he has a God. And he claims that his father is your God. And his. So he's not claiming to be that God. He has that God. That's who he serves. Let me prove it. Let me, uh, talk is cheap. Let me prove it. Let me prove it. I'll just prove it. John 20, 17. Watch this. John 20, 17. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I, I am ascending to my father. Okay, father, father. I am ascending to my father. Watch, watch this. And your father. He's calling his father, your father. And to my God. Oh, he has a God. He has a God. And to your God. His God is your God. 
I'm going to say it again. His father is who he says is your father. And his God is who he says is your God. Now, if he's saying that his father is his God, and his father is your father and your God, he's not claiming to be the father at all. See? Neither is he claiming to be God of himself as another one that just contains the same deity. No. He said the father is the one who is God. So we have just that one individual being, being claimed as God by the son. Not only that, he's making, this, he's making clear that that's the one who you should be serving as God. Because he tells you he's your God. His father is. And he doesn't say that he's, he doesn't identify himself as your father. Neither does he identify himself as your God. But his father, who he's getting ready to ascend to right here, that's who he says is your, your father. And that's who he says is your God. So he is God. See? So, if he's making a distinction between himself <laughs> and the father, when she clearly just did, you would have to be in serious denial in order to deny that. <clears throat> because not only did he make the distinction between himself and his father, he made the distinction between he made the distinction between who's your God and who's your father, even for you. I'll read it one more time. I am ascending to my father and to your father. My father's your father. I'm going to, I'm going to my father, who is your father. And my God, that's my God. He's my father's my God. And your God. He's your God. The one I'm ascending to. He's your God. And he's your father. And he's my God. And he's my father. So clearly, he's not, he's not claiming his identity at all. He's separating that. Very clear. All right? So if he's separating that, then when it says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, now we got to ask What God is that talking about? Because Jesus only mentions one God. He mentions the Father. <laughs> he says only the Father is God. So when we see in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, then this is not talking about another individual. The word is not another individual. The word is part of the father who is, who is the only God that Jesus mentions. He's the only God that Jesus says is God. I'll show you where he said he's the only. Let me, let me, let me show you. Let me show you. Let me show you. Like I said, I'll just give everything to you in the word. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life. That's the son speaking. And this is eternal life that they may know you. He's talking to his father. And he says that they may know you. The only true God. And Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's a distinction, right? I'm sent. But you're the only true God. You sent me. But you're. You, you who sent me, you, you who sent me, you're the only true God. He doesn't include himself in that. He doesn't say Trinity. He doesn't say us. 
He doesn't say we're the only true God. He does not say that. He says his father is the only true God. Okay, so if, if there's only one who is God, one literally, one person, one individual who is God and not a shared union. Because only means only. You, you heard it from him. Now, now, now if, he was a, if, if he was a second person in the Godhead, then he couldn't say that. Because he would be the second one, right? He doesn't say that. He says his father's the only that's not a union. That's not Trinity. That's not what he's teaching there. He's teaching one God and one individual only, his father. Whew. Wow. Wow. So you, you see it? You, you, do you see it? Do you see, that, do you see that his father is his God? And then do you see that his father is your father and your God? You see that? All right, let's look at something else. Uh, yeah, that's where I'm going to go. John 5. Let's go to the fifth chapter of John. John 5 and 22. Watch this. He's going to make another distinction here, y'all. John 5 and 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Now, if that's the same person, how can you commit one thing over to the other? You can't. If that's you, you can't give yourself something you already have. These are two distinct individuals, and one of them is God. That would be the Father. All right? For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That, that all should honor the Son. This is why, that all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You see that? You see that? Now, again, sent him <clears throat> does not necessarily have to mean sent from heaven. Because we have two ways that he can be sent. As we see that John was sent by God. It said John was sent from God. But that doesn't mean that John was sent from heaven. So, in, so let's break down this scent. There's a part of him, there's, there, there is something that was sent from heaven, but that wasn't the sun. <laughs> that wasn't the sun. The word is what was sent from heaven. That proceeds from the father. That comes from the same individual. That's his word. That's what he spoke. That's not someone else sitting next to him. That's not a, another eternal spirit up there. No, that's him. So he sent his word from heaven as, as he said when he said that I proceeded from the Father. Not, not just heaven, but actually from the Father, his very being. Not, uh, not like this. Not like this. Not like, here's the Father and here's the Word. And he sends the Word. No, not like that. The Word was in the Father. Okay? The Word is the Father's Word. The Father spoke the Word. The Word came from the Father. So he didn't just come from heaven. There's an actual location where he came from in heaven, which would be the Father. Now, 
that that came down from there was not the son. That was part of the father himself. The son was created. That's why he's only begotten. And that's why the angel Gabriel said that said to Mary, you should call that holy thing, which was the body. That was the holy thing. He said, you should call that son of God. Nowhere does it say the spirit was the son. Nowhere does it say that there was a pre-existent spirit called son of God. A pre-existent spirit that was called only begotten son of God. And that spirit got into a body. That's not what it said. It says that, <clears throat> that the only begotten son, the son was called that body. Very clear. The angel clearly said, you shall call that holy thing that you shall conceive, Mary. You shall call that holy thing when it shall be born to you. You should, be, you should call that son of God. Okay, so the flesh, the body was the son of God. The son of God was nothing more than just the body. You see, now what got into that body was God, of which Jesus says is only the Father. And you can argue that all you want and say that, well, he's God too. Now, the only reason why he's God too is because of his Father that's dwelling in him, is the spirit that took on that nature of that flesh. The Father is acting as his own spirit. Because spiritually, this, there is no only begotten son. There is no only begotten son in spirit. Only begotten is begotten in flesh. And that's why he's the only. Even though we already had Adam called son of God. We already had the angels called sons of God before him. So his sonship is according to coming through a woman. And that's where it started. Before that, it did not exist. So no, the son of God did not exist before the body. Clearly. I'll show you where God says there was no one else with him. I'll show you. I'll show you. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, so we see John, <clears throat> we see John 22, uh, John 5 and 22 and 25, John 5 and 22, that the father committed the judgment over to the son. All right. Um, let's see, now I want to look at verse 26 of that same chapter, 526. <clears throat> For as the father has life in himself, has life in himself, has, 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 always had it. For as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son to have life in himself. He granted the son to have life in himself. The father already has it. But for the son, he granted the son to have life in himself. So if he's, if, if he's given life, he did not always exist. If he's granted life, Then he, then he was not always. Because you would, if you, if you, if you're an eternal son, if there's a such thing as eternal son, like I said, you will not find the words eternal son in your Bible. You won't, you won't even find son everlasting. You will find everlasting father. And that's why the father has life in himself. But he is granted to the son. To have life in himself. He gave him life. So if life was given to you. You did not always exist. I'm 
I'm gonna help you here. I'm gonna help you here. This is just a word. You can't. You cannot undo this. No matter how hard you try, you cannot undo this. Okay. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son to have, to have, to have life in Himself. Now, if He again, if He always existed eternally, He would already had that. The Father already had that, so wouldn't He? Okay? No, he's being given that by his father. There's a difference. And let's continue. And has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. He gave him authority to execute judgment. The father always had authority to execute judgment. The son is being given that. See the difference? Okay, so we see the father passing tools down to the son. All right. Um, <laughs> I told you this, is, this might shatter some of your belief system, but it's going to be right, right there, right in the word. Like I said, you cannot undo this. Look at verse 30. I can of myself, this is the son speaking, I can of myself do nothing. Does God speak like that? No. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, oh, you're hearing from someone else. Someone's telling you what to do is what you're saying. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will. There's a distinction right there because if he's the same person as the Father, then, then he wouldn't have his own will. It would be the same will. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Clear, right? He's getting all his stuff from God. He's getting it all from God, and he's been given permission to express that. As I told you, there is one who represents God. That's the son. There's the other who is God. He's just a representative. You're getting a representative mixed up with the person. <laughs> he bears the title, the word. But don't get the representative mixed up with the, with the actual word. The word is the spirit. <laughs> the father. <laughs> he bears the title everlasting father. But don't get the representative mixed up with who's actually the everlasting father. The everlasting father was in him. Okay, let's, ah, ah, like I told you, you will not be able to undo any of this. I'll show you something in uh, John 12. Yeah, that's where I want to go. I'm just going to go through some word with you. By the time you get, get, a, get a lot of this coffee here, it'll wake you up. <laughs> Look at John 12. And 47, if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. Okay, now he's saying I don't judge him. Well, we just read a couple, a, a couple in the fifth chapter that the judgment was committed over to him. Now he's saying I don't judge. <laughs> I don't judge him for I did not come into the world I did not come 
to judge the world, I've, but I've come to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which, is, which judges him. The word. <laughs> has that which judges him. The word. That I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority. But the Father who sent me gave me a command. Do you see this? He's under him. They're not equal. They're not on the same level. He's under him. He's not equally God. He's serving God. <laughs> He's being used by God. He's a follower of God. <laughs> and he represents him. Okay? Gave me a command. What I should say and what I should speak. You see that? The Father gave him what to say and what to speak. All right, and I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. You see that? The Son is serving God. He's serving his father. Now let me let me tell you where <sighs> let, let me tell you where um, people have gotten confused. They have gotten confused because they think that he's God himself. Not understanding. No, he's not. It's his father dwelling in him that is enabling him to be the expression of God. But his father is the actual God. He's just given authority to express God because he's a representative. So he's an agent. Yes, yes. He's his agent. When, when you go and let's say it's time to, uh, to vote and you get ready to go and register to vote and stuff, you will see um, the Obama administration, um, those who work for the Obama administration or, you know, um, I'm just using the Obama, um, I could say Biden. Those who work for the Biden administration, you will see that they, they represent Biden. But they're not actually Biden. They're representatives of Biden. They're, administ they're his administration. So they represent him. But there's, a there's actually one who is actually Biden. And they're just his representatives. So they bear his name. They bear his name, his titles, and everything that he's doing because they're representing what he does. This is what Jesus does with the Father. He has the title of the Father, which is um, Everlasting Father, <laughs> Mighty God. But he's really not the Mighty God. He's really not the Everlasting Father. That is who's dwelling in him, but he's not him. <laughs> Do you see? He's a representative of him, and because he's representing him, he bears the titles and the names. But don't get him who bears the titles and the names mixed up with the one who identifies with that actual title and with those actual names. Make sense? The Father, God, he's a spirit. 
And Jesus said, even after the word was made flesh, God is a spirit. So when the word was made flesh, it does not necessarily mean that God transferred his identity from spirit into flesh. Otherwise, he would have been able to say God is flesh now or God is spirit and flesh. But he doesn't. He says God is a spirit and leaves it at that. So the spirit that was in him was the one God. And that would be his father. Okay, let's look at, whew, I hope you're getting something out of this. Look at John 14, 10. I'm going to show you another thing he says. John 14, 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The Father's in me. In me. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. I'm not doing this myself. I'm not doing this myself. <laughs> okay? I don't speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells, dwells, dwells on the inside. The Father who dwells in me does the works. Do you see it? Now, ask yourself this question. Was there a pre-existent son in spirit that got into a body? Or was it the Father that got into a body? Right here, he says, it is the Father who dwells. That's who's in him. The Father. Not Son of, not son of God. Not spiritual Son of God. The Son of God doesn't, doesn't have a, 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 a pre-existent spirit. That's why, like I said, you will not find anywhere where there was ever a spirit referred to as the son of God. You won't find that. Do the research. You won't find anywhere before the body, even the term being used, only begotten son. You won't find that until the flesh came. Because there was no everlasting Son of God. Just God. See? Whew. All right, now let's get into some real deep stuff here. Um, that was already deep, but let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. I'm going to show you some stuff you cannot wrestle with. <laughs> I'm going to show you some stuff you cannot wrestle with. This will tear your religion down. <laughs> and it's God that's going to tear it down. All right. But after this, you're going to be free. You ain't going to have no questions <laughs> about Godhead. Watch this. Look at Isaiah 45. And... Uh, Verse 12. This is God speaking, y'all. Let's hear what he has to say about Godhead. <laughs> okay? Any, if anyone knows the Godhead, it would be God, right? Um, Trinitarians can't break it down like God. Not even oneness can break it down like God. Can't nobody break it down like God <laughs> other than God. Who's greater explaining God than God? And if you can't believe him, then you seriously got a problem. Because <laughs> he knows what he is, right? All right, let's see what he said. Let's see what he said. 
Forget whatever denomination you come from or whatever you've been taught or whatever you believe. Let's hear what God said about himself. All right. Isaiah 45, 12. I. Now, that's right. That right there is very singular. I means I, right? I doesn't mean us, I doesn't mean we, my I doesn't mean them. I have made the earth and created man on it. That's singular, right? One person did that. Okay, but you say the Bible says let us. Yeah, but right here, let's not get no confusion on the us. Right here, he says I have made the earth. And created man on it. I, my hands, stretched out the heavens. Okay? God said he did. And he's speaking singular, not plural. <laughs> There's a plurality in the way he functions, though. So that is where the us can be. Plurality of functions, not plurality in persons. <laughs> because man didn't understand that. They took that and said, oh, Trinity. The word Trinity is not in your Bible. Neither is there anyone who describes that. Neither is, There's not one person in scripture that describes God as a Trinity. Not one. Old Testament, New Testament, none. That came from man, came from Rome. That's a teaching from Rome, the Roman Catholics. That's a Catholicism teaching. Came way later, after, many years after the Bible was written. They all believe one God and one individual only. Okay? Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, Let's see. Let's look at some more. So we see that God, that God is the one that created man. He said, I. All right. Um, we see that he he stretched. He said his hands, his hands stretched out the heavens. OK, so we could say his hands and maybe that could be with us is referring to this parts of himself. Because he still says, I have done that. OK, um, let's look at verse 15, truly, you, that means one you, right? You don't mean us, does it? You don't mean them, does it? You means you, right? Truly, you are God who hide yourself. All right, now that would make sense, God in the flesh. That would make sense, God in the bush. That would make sense... God in a cloud. That would make sense. God in a pillar of fire. That would make sense. Um, God manifesting himself in many different ways. Hiding himself. Truly, you are God who hide yourself. Evidence. God hides himself. O God of Israel, the Savior. He's the Savior, y'all. Who's the Savior? The Father. The Father's called the Savior. All right, um, so we see that he hides himself. So that would make sense, God in the flesh, hiding himself, reconciling the world um, to himself. They shall, verse 16, they shall be ashamed and also disgraced, all of them. They shall go in confusion together, who are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. For thus says the Lord. Is the Lord speaking? For thus says the Lord. Not one of them. Not third person in the Trinity. Not second person in the Trinity. Not first person. Thus says the Lord. One Lord, y'all, who created the heavens? Who is God? God is a who? God is a who? 
scripture says God is a who. Where you get union. That lie told you that. Bible says God is who. Who. That means a person. That's an individual who is God. So it's biblical that God is a who. Not an it. Not a government. Not a power. Not an expression of a power or a government or an authority. Not a union. Who, for thus says the Lord, who, Lord is a who, created heavens, the heavens, who is God? There he is, who? Someone who is God? Who formed the earth and made it, formed it? It made it. Who formed it? It made it. So a who formed it and made it. Not an it. Not a government. Not a union. Not a trinity. Who formed it? Who formed the earth and made it? Who established it? Who didn't? See all these who's? Do you see this? Do you see all these who's? Who did not create it in vain? Who formed it to be inhabited. I. That's singular. I is singular. And that is talking about the who. I am the Lord. And there is no other. Clear, right? Clear, right? <laughs> you gonna wrestle with that? <laughs> that's him speaking there. <laughs> okay? Um, let's see what else I want to show you. Uh, yeah, look at verse 21. <clears throat> Tell and bring forth your, your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient times? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and be I the Lord, I, not us, not we, I, the Lord, and there is no other God besides me. That's God speaking. There is no other God besides me, not us, me, 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 me. me. What part of me don't you get? <laughs> How do you get three persons out of me? Me. Okay. <laughs> and there is no other God besides me. A just God and Savior. Savior? Savior? Sound familiar, don't it? So that Savior... In the in the in the new New Testament, is Him. I told you it was God all along. God, God in the flesh, reconciling the world to Himself. <laughs> As He said, there is no other God besides Me. He doesn't include nobody else in that. Just Him, one alone. One, not the union, one alone. Me, me cuts out union. Me is talking about person now. We, 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 we're dealing with, we're connecting this, we're linking this to one person when you say me. <laughs> okay? And there is no other God besides me. That links it to a person, an individual. That cuts a union out. A just God and Savior. And there is none besides, once again, me. So he calls, he says he's God and Savior. He says he, he calls himself 
He says there's no other God besides just him using the word me. And he says a just God and Savior. So who's the Savior? God is. God is. <laughs> it's the Father that came through. The, the, he created the Son and he came in the human flesh and he reconciled the world to himself. This was him. It was him. <laughs> He's the one that's, that, that said me. Besides me, there's no other. That, that was him that came in the flesh, y'all. It wasn't someone else. Okay, it wasn't a second person in the Trinity. It wasn't that. It was him. All right. Um, okay. Uh, gosh, what else I want to show you? There's so much here. Look at forty four twenty four. Okay. He just is so many times he says the same thing. 44, 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. Ah, sound familiar? Isn't Jesus the Redeemer? He's the Lord that redeemed us, right? Doesn't that sound familiar? I told you it's him. <laughs> the God of the Old Testament. That is who came down here. In a body. I told you. It's not someone else. It's him. Thus says the Lord. Your redeemer. And he who formed you. From the womb. I am the Lord. Who makes all things. I. He doesn't mention nobody else in that. I. In the Lord who makes all things. He's not crediting to others. I. He says. You're getting his manifestations. And his plurality of function. Is mixed up with persons. Because the Trinity has bombarded you. With a Catholicism lie. That came years later. After the Bible was already written. I am the Lord. Who makes all things. Who stretches out the heavens. All alone. That's clear, right? All alone? All alone, right? How do you get three persons out of all alone? That's, that's not alone. You got two more with you. All alone, he said. He did that all alone. So whatever it is that you're thinking is another person, that's not another person. That's still consistent of the same person. Those are just functions of him. Because he says, all alone. Can't argue with all alone, right? Let's go a little further. Who spread abroad the earth by myself. Can you, can you argue with that? By myself means really by myself, right? Or does by myself mean to others? By myself. So we see all alone and we see by myself. That means that's just one, right? One literally. That don't have nothing to do with no union. You can't even use words like by myself if, if there's a union of any sort. <laughs> by myself cuts out any type of union. <laughs> by myself and all alone cuts out any type of trinity. That cuts that away. Completely away. And this is God speaking here. This is not Paul. This is not somebody that you might, might say, well, maybe he was smoking something. No, this is coming from God. <laughs> All right. Whew. There's something else I wanted to show you. By myself means by myself, y'all. All alone means all alone. 
There's no confusion in that. That's just, <laughs> if you're still struggling with that, that's just your, your, your tradition that's messing you up. The traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. Got to be careful with all that traditional stuff you've been taught and go by what the word says. That's God himself speaking right there. He said all by himself he did that. He said all alone. 40, 43. Um, yeah. 43 and 10. That's what I want to show you. You are my witnesses. I'm still in Isaiah. Isaiah 43 and 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord. And my chosen servant whom I have, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed. The, the, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me slow down a little bit. I want, I want you to hear the language. Listen how God is talking. It's like he's pulling you by the collar. And talking to you like, let me show you something, son. You are my witnesses, says the Lord. And my servant, whom I have chosen. Okay, now that's how he starts. You are my witnesses. And my servant. Now let me explain something to you, my witnesses. Let me explain. Since you're witnessing for me, let me explain something to you, my witnesses. Let me explain something to you, my servant. <laughs> Watch what he says now. Get that language. That you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Okay. He's establishing something here. <laughs> that you may know, that you may believe me, that you may know and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed. Nor shall there be after me. That means that will never change. As it was in the beginning, so it is now. None before, none after. I, even I, am the Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. No Savior. Who's the Savior now? <laughs> I told you it's God. I told you it's the Father. He's the one that saved you. Told you. It was him all along. God in flesh. He just came in that flesh, but it was him all along. Doesn't he say that? Besides me, there's no savior. We don't have two saviors. Besides me, there's no savior. That's what he's, that's the father. The son is just a body, I told you. The only begotten son was a body that he created for himself. He told you he was alone. Wasn't nobody with him. Wasn't no eternal son up in heaven. Are you crazy? That's not what he said. That's what that Trinitarian teaching taught you. It's a lie. Um, man, this is deep. I'll show you. I'll show you one last thing, and then um, I'll leave it at that. I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you something in your Bible that does describe a Trinity. But it doesn't pertain to God. Watch this. I will show you something in your Bible that describes a function of a trinity, but it's not talking about God. 
Let me turn these lights on. It's getting a little dark in here. Give me one second. Okay, there we go. All right. All right. <clears throat> Look at Ezekiel. One and five. I'm going to show you some creatures here that function in the likeness of a trinity. It's actually, instead of three and one, it's four and one. I'm going to show you something. All right. Ezekiel, one and five. Now, I'm going to show you. God knows how to count, and God knows how to make sense, and God knows how to make things clear of what they really are. Every prophet that saw what was on the throne in heaven, they all saw just one. There's not one prophet or apostle from the Old Testament prophets to the New Testament apostle. None of them seen more than one sitting on the throne. Never. They all saw one. Not one person seen three people up there. Never. And God is the one that gives the vision. He designed it. So he knows what he wants you to see, right? Let me show you something. Look at this. <clears throat> Ezekiel 1 and 5. <clears throat> also from within. Now it's talking about these angelical... Uh, high up angels in heaven, and um, I'll, I'll try try to read through it quickly and uh, share some things on it. Also, from within it came the likeness of four living creatures. Four living cre four right. Now this is a a vision that Ezekiel is seeing. Remember, visions come. These visions come from God. So God is the one that designed the vision. He's the one who's revealing it to him and, and, and causing him to see what he sees. So whatever's in it, it's the Lord that's showing him that. All right? That's, that's important to understand. The vision is coming from God. He designed it. And whatever they're seeing, that's what the Lord wants them to recognize. Okay. So, <clears throat> also from within was the likeness of four living creatures, and the and this was the appearance. All right, this is what the appearance. This would be what the Lord wanted them, to, what wanted him to see, and he gets to describe what he saw. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces. Each one had four wings, their legs were straight, and the sole of their feet were like the soles of, of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of um, burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings and their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings the wings touch one another these this is detail y'all the wings touch one another the creatures did not turn when they went but each one went straight forward so they're operating in unity right as for the likeness of their faces now he even sees the likeness of each one of the four living creatures faces First, he sees four, and he's able to describe the four. All right? Remember, God gave the vision. And he's causing him to, he, he designed it in a way for, for Ezekiel to see what's up there. And he sees these four. Because it is four. <clears throat> As of the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side 
each of the four had the face of an ox on the left. Each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces. Okay? He saw their faces. He saw, he was able to describe their wings. He was able to describe what they looked like. Each of the four in detail. God don't make mistakes. Their wings stretched upward. Two wings of each one touched one another. And the two covered their bodies. All right? And each one straight forward. Where, watch this, they went wherever the Spirit wanted to go. They went wherever the Spirit wanted to go. And they did not turn when they went. All right, so we see the, the, these four angelical creatures. Ezekiel sees four because God gave him the vision and God designed the vision to make him see four. Because there was four up there. All right. Now we see they're they're operating in a unity. <laughs> they're operating in a unity. Look at verse 15. Now as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each of the living creatures, each of the, the living creatures creature with its four faces. <clears throat> the appearance of the wheels and the working was like the color of barrel and all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their working was, was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they moved watch this, watch the unity when they moved they went toward any of the four directions. Um, they did not turn aside when they went. Okay, so we, we still see a unity happening here. These four are in a union. <laughs> Sound familiar? Sound like Trinity, huh? <laughs> okay. Now watch this. Look at verse 20. I'm skipping down. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went. Because there the Spirit went. And the wheels were lifted up together with them. Watch this. For the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. The Spirit of the living creatures, not spirits of the living creature, not plural. Four creatures, one spirit. Sounds like Trinity, right? But it's four in one spirit instead of three. Do you see that? Now, <laughs> let me explain something. This is the same thing that John sees. And John also sees four in the book of Revelation. Now, a vision given to you by God is designed by God so God knows what he wants you to see and what he wants you to recognize so he gives Ezekiel a vision of four living creatures in heaven he sees all four four of them up there God is not confused. He's not the author of confusion. He's not going to show him one when it's four. He showed four. <laughs> and all four of them were in union together. 
And all four of them shared one spirit. <laughs> okay? So they operated in perfect union and harmony with one another in the way that you would describe a trinity. <laughs> so they operated like a trinity. But when it comes to God, watch what he shows Ezekiel in the same vision. Uh, are y'all still here? <laughs> Look at verse 26. And above the firmament, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne. One throne, right? In appearance, like sapphire stone. And the likeness of the throne was the likeness with the appearance of of a man high above it. Did he see three persons on that throne? Nope. <laughs> he sees one. So God, watch this. Ah, man, y'all need to hear this. God shows Ezekiel a vision that is designed to cause him to see what's in heaven. God's the one that designed the vision. It came from him. Everything that he's seeing in it is what he wants him to recognize so that he can describe it as scripture for us. Okay, God is not the author of confusion. So he, he sees in clear detail the four living creatures. He's able to describe what they look like. He's able to describe what they have. He's able to, to describe each of their faces. He's able to describe even how they function in the unity. And then he's able to even announce that they share one spirit. Four and one. That is the likeness of a trinity. But yet God shows four to Ezekiel. Now, when it comes to God, <laughs> in the same vision, he gives detail also on what's on the throne. And what he shows him on the throne is one. <laughs> If it was three of them on the throne or three persons or a trinity with God, then he would show Ezekiel a trinity with God as well. Because he just showed them something that represents a trinity with the angels. <laughs> but yet he was able to make distinction and show them all four. Show them all four. He saw four beings, four creatures and describe each of the four but when it comes to the throne of God God designed the vision for him to see only one only one man on that throne see it because that's all there is <laughs> there is not three persons on the throne there's one. All right, all right. And the reason why God gave it to him in this way is because that's what he wanted him to recognize. Now, you've got to be crazy out of your mind to think that God would give details of distinct angelical beings and show four of them operating in the union of one spirit. But if he was a trinity, not show three of him operating in the union of one spirit, you think God would give more detail concerning an angel, concerning angels than himself? You got to be crazy to believe that. 
he gave him details about the angels being four. He gave them details about the, the four angels operating with one spirit in a complete union, similar to a trinity. <laughs> but when it came to him, he didn't show nothing about no trinity. He showed one man on the throne. Now, not only did he show it to him, but he also showed it to John. Let me show you. Look at John. Let's look at Revelation 4 and 7. I'll show you. John saw the same thing. God is not the author of confusion. If he's three persons, he will show you three persons. He's the one that designed the vision. He's not going to give you a vision designed for you to see one person on the throne when it's three of them. If it's three of them, he's going to tell you it's three of them so that you can write it down and so that people can study that and know that. But if it's one, he's going to show you it's one. And that's exactly what he did. It was four of the angels. He showed him four of the angels because that's what it is. It was one of him and he showed one of him. See? He's clear. It's clear, yo. All right. Look at John um, Revelation 4 and 7. This is the Apostle John speaking here. He sees something like this. Watch. He sees what um, Ezekiel saw. The first living creature was of a lion. The second living creature was of a cow. The third living creature had the face of a man like a man and the fourth living creature like the face like an eagle. The four living creatures. He saw four too. You see? He saw four. Four living creatures having six wings and full of eyes all around and they do not rest day or night saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the four living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne. Not them. Him. Who sits on the throne. Who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him. Who sits on the throne and worship him, not them, not Trinity, him. All right, I'm going to stop there. Stop there. Okay, you see this, right? So we see that Ezekiel in the Old Testament sees a vision given to him by God, designed by God, causes him to see what's in heaven. He sees exactly what's there. Four living creatures. Was able to describe them all, what they look like. Notice that there was four of them. And that they operated in a union of one spirit. And wherever that spirit went, that's where they went. They shared the same spirit. So for with one spirit in complete and total unity with one another. That is similar to a trinity. Now that would will, that will make sense to call that a trinity. But when it came to God. Ezekiel only saw one man on the throne. God shows the Apostle John the same vision that he showed Ezekiel in the Old Testament, but gives him different details about it. But he also saw four creatures. Was he even able to describe them as the first, the second, the third, and the fourth? Noticing four of them. But when it came to who was on the throne, he also saw just one person. 
He also saw just one individual being worshipped on the throne. He did not see three persons when it came to God. So once again, if God is able to give all this detail concerning to angel, angels and narrow them down to make sense that it's four of them and allow both of who he gave this vision to, to see four, then if he was more than one, then he would show you. He would show them more than one. But for him, he only showed one on the throne because that's what he wanted them to recognize was one on the throne. You see? Let me say it this way. Let's say there's me and two others. Okay? All of us are God. We share a union equally. All right. I'm going to give my servant a vision. In that vision, I'm going to make sure that I design it in a way for my servant to see, hey, I got four angels be before me. I'm going to let them see that, that there's four of them. But I know personally that there's three of me, but I'm only going to show them one. I'm going I'm I'm to set that vision up so that they can only just see one. Why would I do that? If it's, if it's four of them and three of me, then I need to show my servant it's three of me, just like I'm showing my servant there's four of my angels. You see, God is not the author of confusion. He's the spirit of truth, not the spirit of error. If it's three of him, if it's three persons, then he would he would have gave them he would gave them both a vision that where they saw three individuals on the throne as God. They did not. They saw one. See? Makes sense. God is God and God is one alone, y'all. Um, I'll show you. One last thing, and then I'll be done. Um, I'll show you someone else who saw what was up there. And, and him, too. He only saw one. <laughs> See? See what I'm saying? We got we to gotta, we gotta get the lie out. Look at, look at Acts 7 and 15. 55 Acts 7 55 this is Stephen and watch what he saw up there but he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, the right hand of God, those of you who don't know, it does not mean like this. God here and him there. That's not what that means. The right hand of God is a, is a figure of speech that represents majesty. Meaning the throne. That's what he saw. He saw Jesus on the throne. As I said before, to actually be next to God, literally, you would have to first of all understand how big God is. God feels heaven. Earth is his footstool. The Bible says he has the stoop down in order to even get into the earth. That's how big God is. So if he already fills heaven, then to sit next to God, literally, where would he sit? <laughs> the middle of nowhere? Outside of heaven? That's not talking about next to him, literally. It's not this. Right hand means the hand of authority. As you see right here, you see him standing, actually. He's not sitting. 
So the right doesn't actually mean what, what you're thinking next to. That, that's not what that means. It means the, 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 the majesty and the power. And that's why when Stephen saw him, he saw him with the glory of God all over him because the right hand represents the majesty, the power, the glory of God. So again, the only man that he saw up there was Jesus. He didn't see no one else. Now do you see it? There's only one on the throne. It is this it is Jesus Christ. And the Father is fully indwelling him. Now yes, he still he still has the title son of God. But he's fully functioning as God. Because all power and authority has been given to him over heaven and earth to function in the likeness of his father. So he's able to equally function as God. He can express the same thing, but he's still not that God. His father is. As you will see in the book of Revelation, the third chapter, he still calls the father God. He calls the Father his God about four or five times in the, in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. So he still has a God. He wasn't replaced. You know, some people believe he was replaced. No, no, uh-uh. He wasn't, you know, he's still, he's still son. Now, what, what may have been replaced is Mary's boy, because Mary's not the mother of a glorified body. But God is the, still the father of a glorified body. So we still have a son. <laughs> See? Just different than begotten. Because that body wasn't begotten. So he still would be son of God. <laughs> that body would still be called son of God because God created that body. That glorified body, even that was created by God. So he's still father over that body. That one too. You see? So in him right now um, dwells the fullness of the Godhead, which would be his father. And um, he is able to express equally the same power and authority, uh, which is over heaven and earth, equally to his father. That's why he doesn't consider it robbery to be called equal with God, because he's able to express the same thing. And the spirit that's in him is God, which would be the father. So we still have the father fully indwelling the son. That's called the fullness of the Godhead. And then we have bodily, which is the glorified body uh, uh, right now. And that is who is on the throne. So if you was to go to heaven, who you would see sitting on the throne is you would see Jesus. <laughs> With the Father fully indwelling him. The Holy Spirit is just the Father's breath. So that's indwelling him too. So there you have it, y'all. Um, I have shown you many passages of scripture where the Bible points to one God, one individual who is God. And uh, we see that everyone who saw what was on the throne only saw one. And we see, um, what else? I'm, I'm just recapping now. Uh, what else we see? We see the Father himself in the book of Isaiah say many times, I ain't even get into the book of Deuteronomy where he said some stuff, or when Jesus um, endorsed the commandment that the first commandment is that, hear, O Israel, that the Lord our God is one God. <laughs> he endorsed that, quoting Deuteronomy. Um, I didn't even go into that. There's so much more I could go into to prove that. 
But as we see, we see that the Lord is our Savior in the book of Isaiah. We see that he's the Savior, he's the Redeemer. All that ties to Jesus, doesn't it? You see? I told you it was God that came in the flesh. Um, there is there's one thing I wanted to show you. I'll do. I'll, I'll show you one last thing before I forget. First um, Corinthians fifteen. Let me just show you. It was the Lord that came down. All right. First Corinthians. Um, Fifteen. Yeah. First Corinthians fifteen forty five. I'll show you this real quick. <clears throat> and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, the Son of God, the only begotten Son, is referred to as the last Adam because he was a representative for us. Um, but also, he came later. It's the same thing. Um, representative for us, just like Adam was a representative for us, and Adam fell uh, um, due to sin and caused all humanity to fall. Um, Jesus being the second Adam was also a representative for us, but he did not fall. He did everything right. And through his righteousness, many were made righteous because of their faith in him. So, um, he called, he stood in the gap for all of mankind, just like Adam stood in the gap for all of mankind. Um, we only have two that did that, Adam and Jesus. Adam was a representative of all humanity. Jesus was a representative of all humanity. Adam fell. Jesus did everything perfect. And through his perfection and faith in him, then we're given credit for that. And um, even though we have not worked for it, but we are imputed his righteousness by his performance. Just like with Adam, we was imputed the curse and the fall, even though we ourselves did not do the likeness of the works of disobedience that Adam did, but yet we were still held accountable. Likewise, with, with Jesus being the second Adam, him doing everything righteous and, perform, and, and his performance based on keeping the law of Moses perfectly without any flaws, then we were given credit for that as believers. And that is then applied to us so that we have peace with God instead of wrath. And we are looked at as pleasing to God, not because of our own works or effort, but because of what he has done um, through his finished work. All right. Um, however, the spiritual um, body, uh, however, the, the spirit is not first, but the natural and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Did you hear it? Did you hear it? The second man is the Lord from heaven. Not one of the lords, not Lord two, not Lord three, <laughs> none of that foolishness. The Lord from heaven. God himself dwelt in a body through a manifestation of himself, which is called the word. That's who was in Christ. That's who was in the body. And it was him that was working through that body and reconciling the world 
to himself. So yes, God came in the flesh. There you have it, y'all. Peace.